The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, it's one o'clock on the dot, so we're gonna get ready. And uh, as people come in, we'll uh, we'll welcome them. So good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle Morrison, and thank you for joining us for the first webinar of CIC's 2021 webinar series, offered jointly through CIC and our valued member Wood. Wood is a global leader in engineering and consultancy across energy and the built environment, helping to unlock solutions to some of the world's most critical challenges. They provide performance-driven solutions throughout the asset life cycle, from concept to decommissioning across a broad range of industrial markets, including upstream, midstream, and downstream oil and gas, chemicals, environment and infrastructure, power and process, clean energy, mining, nuclear, and general, general industrial sectors. Today, we will hear from three panelists from Wood about chronic unease, a built-in warning system that alerts us to danger and provides us with the awareness that something is not as it should be and how we can leverage it to prevent loss. Today, we'll hear from uh, first Vaughn Jedry, who brings 25 years of mining, construction, and transportation experience. With origins in the mining sector, Vaughn moved from a training and development position during the construction and development uh, phases of some of Canada's largest uranium projects to several managerial roles and subsequently an executive leadership role, where she was responsible for the development and implementation of health and safety systems spanning across business lines in Canada, the United States, and the UK. Our next panelist, Jason Westrup, has more than 20 years of experience in delivering projects within the oil, gas, and petrochemical industry. He is a dynamic, innovative leader who has harvested an extensive range of expertise and experience. Originating from construction, he has progressively advanced his development, uh, professional development in senior roles through construction, commissioning, project engineering, engineering man management through two project management of complex multi-billion dollar mega projects. Our final panelist, Corey Callahan, is Woods Director of Construction for Western Canada. With almost 30 years of industrial construction experience, Corey manages Woods Direct Hire and Construction Management Division. Before joining Wood in July of 2019, Corey spent 20 years as Vice President of North American Fabrication and, modular and modular Modularization uh, for one of the largest fabricators in Canada, with opera operations in Alberta, Phoenix, and Houston. Finally, this session will be moderated by Scott Rempel, an accomplished sales and marketing professional with a strong depth of experience within the various aspects of sales, marketing, communications, and project management. Scott has worked in the in energy industry for over 20 years, of which the first six years were spent in the electricity and power sector, and then 16 years in the oil and gas sector. He is currently working as the Vice President, Business Development and Strategy at Wood. A few things to note before we do get started. Uh, you have all been placed on mute for the duration of the webinar. However, if at any point you do have questions, uh, please feel free to use the question function and there will be an opportunity at the end for a question and answer, se question and answer session. The webinar will also be recorded. So if it, you miss anything or have colleagues that were unable to attend, the webinar will be made available uh, after the session. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Scott to begin the session. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Danielle. I trust everybody can hear me okay. Uh, just, yeah, my name is Scott Rempel. Uh, as Danielle mentioned, I'm uh, Vice President of Strategy and Development for Wood. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Wood, as Danielle said, we're a global leader in engineering and consultancy across the energy and built environment. Uh, we provide consulting project delivery and operation solutions in more than 60 countries uh, and employ over 45,000 people worldwide. 
Now, some of you may be more familiar with our legacy companies, uh, AMEC, Foster Wheeler, and Wood Group, and we came together as one in 2017. From a Canadian perspective, we've got approximately 4,000 employees in Canada and have offices in, in every province. Uh, the oil, gas, and chemical segment is a significant portion of our portfolio. It was, represents about 35% of our portfolio worldwide and a similar ratio here in Canada. And we're very committed to those segments and the clients within. We're involved in most of the petrochemical projects here in Alberta. Uh, and have performed projects and operations work at several petrochemical plants across Canada. We're proud members of the Chemistry Industry Association of Canada and are very pleased to be able to bring this presentation to the members today. Danielle uh, introduced our speakers and I just am really pleased that we're able to come and, and share our experiences with you. All of the speakers have got a very significant passion for safety and the topic that we're presenting today. So again, thank you to the CIAC and you, the members, for your time, and I hope you enjoy the, the discussion today. So Vaughn, with that, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everybody. Um, I echo Scott's uh, earlier comments that we're very pleased to have you join us this morning. We're very pleased to be invited to participate in this event. And I just want to thank uh, ahead of time the CIAC members and the others that have chosen to join us today. So just a quick overview of our agenda. Uh, we're going to first start off by talking about our core values, the values we, we, we share at Wood, but also hopefully it will get um, us all thinking about th those values and what they really mean. Um, I want to talk a, a bit about generative safety and that's really, you know, kind of at the crux of our, our presentation is generative, building a generative safety culture and what that means. I'll share with you some industry performance that we've collected through CII, that's the Construction Industry Institute of, uh, Construction Industry Institute based out of uh, the University of Texas. And then we'll go into some chronic unease um, information. We'll talk about weak signals, how to avoid complacency and other types of mine traps. I'm pleased that Corey Callahan and Jason Westrup are here to share their insights into chronic unease at various stages of construction or project delivery. So they've got some great insights in terms of you know what they see as sources of chronic unease within each of their functions and some strategies or countermeasures and how to um, combat that risk. So I'll just ask uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'd like to talk to you just briefly about the core values that we work by and live by at Wood. And really they're made up of three, uh, uh, care, courage, and commitment. So really what this means to us is that, you know, it, it all starts, building a strong culture all starts with um, establishing and, and promoting and sharing a real sense of caring for all stakeholders, be it um, wood employees or subcontractors, clients, anybody that plays a role in the project. We, need, we make a, a conscious effort to bring them into the team and demonstrate care for, for them, uh, care for their families and, and care for the communities. So, you know, really once that foundational um, core value is in place, we start to look at our commitments and what we can do to build stronger projects, safer projects, stronger communities. And we also have to ensure that we've, we are fulfilling all commitments we made to clients and other members of the community. But really when I talk about generative safety and thinking di differently about how we execute health and safety programs, we, it's really important to think about the amount of courage that it takes to do that. Um, when you look at a, sorry, there's a dog starting to bark. Uh, when we really look at the amount of courage that it takes to, to strongly execute, we can think of a worker that's on site and um, how we ask mo most all workers to demonstrate um, or, or, or conduct a an observation sometimes on a daily basis. And this involves them approaching another worker and discussing 
what could be a sensitive uh, safety topic, especially when it gets into behaviors and conditions that are, are in effect. Now, we tell workers that, you know, yeah, it takes courage to approach another worker, and it really takes courage to stand up for safe work practices, safe execution. And, you know, by doing that, it, it grows the culture of not only uh, the crew, but also the project and, and ultimately the organizations. So this is how we weave our three core commitments um, into how we, or how we look and execute health and safety. So if I could go to the next slide, and thank you for driving. So the first part of our presentation, I want to talk to you a bit about uh, generative safety culture. And I know that there's been a good amount of talk around this in the, in the past years, and we've all seen the, the, the ladder that gets us towards generative safety, but I just wanted to dig into that a little more and talk to you about it. So Sonia, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So most of us in the industry that we work in, we understand that, uh, you know, it, it can, it is hazardous, they are hazardous environments that we work in, um, be it, you know, on conventional oil and gas, petrochemical, on uh, live sites or sites under construction, they all carry a certain amount of risk, um, an, an elevated risk. So I believe that over the last few years, people have really started to think more and more about, you know, what it means to move towards a generative safety culture. And we can look back into the various steps of the, of the culture ladder, and really we can take ourselves through a bit of our, our own history. Um, so, and what I mean by this is when we look at a pathological um, culture, m many of us have worked in this, in this environment where um, really work and safety and uh, risk, taking on risk is really about, you know, let's do it. It's fine as long as we don't get caught. And I think that early in most of our careers, we can probably remember working in an environment where it was pathological and it was, you know, flying under the radar, do the work, just don't get caught. A step up from that is really reactive. And this is where safety is important. And a lot of our attentions um, go towards mitigation, mitigation to the project or, or the company if we have an accident. So a, a number of smaller companies, you see this, is um, when there is an incident, all the, the work stops, all efforts go towards minimizing the impact of the incident to the project. So, you know, and generally what happens next is that you, you the dust settles, you return to work, and you kind of, and you generally keep doing the same things that you were doing before. So you would be in a very reactive um, health, and, health and safety culture. But as you move up the ladder and you look at calculative, calculative safety, this is these are companies and organizations that have good systems in place that manage the risk that their their workers are exposed to <clears throat> excuse me um so but you know they can be implemented at various levels and they can be really good in one one piece of the safe work execution and planning and not consistently applying policies in other areas uh, when we move up into proactive safety Safety leadership and values drive continuous improvement. So there's a, a good commitment at this level. Um, there's a lot of really good things happening. There's reporting, there's some accountabilities, um, and your, your health and safety system is generally uh, maturing at this point. But really what, what we wanna talk about today is how we get to a generative safety culture where safety really just becomes part of our DNA. And that happens at all levels and all tiers and all departments of the organization. It's, it's, it requires a lot of work. It's a great endeavor, it's a great initiative. It's probably one of the highest um, goals that we can have as an industry is to get ourselves into uh, um, consistently applied generative safety culture. So generative safety is, is really where we start to see the whole concept of chronic unease moving into the picture. 
you know, if you noticed on the lower steps of the ladder, generally um, chronic anise is not really a factor um, because in those lower levels, we're generally too wrapped up in the in the day to day world when to really uh, talk about things like chronic anise and, and weak signals and understanding mind traps and those types of things. Um, in a generative culture, um, we all start to form new habits and that's those are things like we start to use our chronic anise. We can form new habits around listening to and responding to our instincts and form other habits to listen to the instincts of others. So, so generative safety it's a high great endeavor. It takes a lot of work because uh, you, you know, not only have to look at what the organization is prepared to do to support generative safety, but also what each individual member of the team is prepared to do. It's going to require a lot of commitment, um, getting people excited about the prospect of, of really heading towards a zero loss environment. So a good deal of work, but really well worth the effort. So if we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to share with you some information that uh, we collect on industry performance. So if you go to the next slide, we get this chart from the Construction Industry Institute. Uh, I mentioned it early from the University of Texas at Austin. And if you look at the red line, um, back in 1999, they were tracking a, a total recordable incident rate of 14.3, and that was for uh, general construction in the United States. So you can see that over the years coming up to 2018, they saw a steady decline to where they sit generally around 3.1 uh, to 3, 3 in the, uh, for a total recordable incident rate. But if you look at that green line, back in 19, 1999, the Construction Industry Institute members um, were on a steady decline headed towards about uh, 0.22 in 2019. So the, tw the, the CII membership is, is made up of global construction providers and engineering services owners. And uh, so all of those hours and, and incidents are collected annually by, by CII and they uh, submit this report. But really what caught our attention when we look at this is that for the longest time, you know, starting really around 2011, we really haven't made much of an impact in terms of really getting to zero loss. And it's it's like our industry has really reached a plateau. So the question begs, what lies between 0.22 and zero? So if I can get you to just flip to the next slide. So we need to ask ourselves as an industry, what lies below that line? Um, we can uh, make an assumption that above that line, this is where the proactive, calculative, reactive cultures and processes are at work, and they've gotten us to a certain point. Uh, particularly in the proactive uh, area, this is where a lot of process procedure training um, has been developed and implemented and is used on site. But you know, we're gonna talk about how paper can only get us so far. And what uh, lies below the line is our, is us. Um, our, our, you know, how, our sense of chronic and ease. We start to rely and, and listen to our instincts. We think about our choices and how they're gonna impact us. Our, beha our, our behaviors, traveling to work, being at work, going home. There's so many behaviors that occur during that time. Um, do, you, do we ever take the time to really evaluate those and understand the risks that it may bring? We really, uh, during um, this stage, we really start to look at our own personal commitments. And then we have to assess our levels of complacency. We have to evaluate our own paradigms around health and safety. And we have to be mindful of some of those traps that we can get caught up in. So by really doing, you know, working on these types of things is going to push us further down into the generative uh, range, which inevitably gets us closer to zero loss. So we can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to share just an 
example, uh, you know, just to illustrate my point earlier, is that if we are we truly living below the line? And this is a, a bit of a challenge out to to the team to you know give yourself a scenario or or use this one and help, understand where you are where you are are you above the line or below the line so i ask you to consider a time when you completed a journey management plan and now you're sitting in the driver's seat ready to leave the parking lot so the paper's all done everybody's informed you got the signatures you need and you, you leave the parking lot and you start driving now what what happens in the space between leaving that your destin or your your uh, departure area and arriving at your destination? Everything that happens between those two points is completely in your hands. The condition that you get to your destination is going to largely rely on things like your choices and how you use your chronic unease if you use your chronic unease. How do you make decisions? Uh, do your paradigms influence your decision makings? What kind of commitments have you made? And you know, think about the choices you're making and those mind traps. There's so many other things that can act on us like human factors, fatigue, stress, complacency, speed, and distraction. So if when you're driving from point A to point B in that space of time, what are the decisions that you make? Do you, do you speed? Do you choose to speed or do you drive to conditions or maybe reduce speed on, under um, uh, poor road conditions? Do you choose to talk on your phone or don't you? These are all examples of some of those behaviors that can impact how we will arrive um, at our destination. And I can't emphasize enough that it's what lies between those two points is in your hands and it depends largely on you. So if we can go to that next uh, slide, I wanted to talk briefly again about chronic unease and understanding key attributes and the weak signals. So if we can move to the next slide. So first of all, and I think by this time, a lot of folks on the call have probably been uh, looking at working with or using uh, some type of chronic unease um, approach. So when we look at what chronic unease is, a really uh, simple, straightforward response to that would be that it's the opposite of complacency. And it's about inquiring and probing deeper and deeper into the weak signals that we get from time to time. Um, the weak signals are really just an internal warning system that's telling us that something may not be quite right. And you know, and you can choose to um, dig deeper into the weak signals and understand it, or you can choose to ignore it. Again, that's a choice. So um, there are specific personal attributes that we often see with chronically uneasy people. And I'll just share them really quick with you and, and you can later do um, a bit of an assessment within your team or um, personally to just to get a, a good understanding of where you are in terms of holding those personal attributes. So the first one is really to be open and responsive. And this is uh, open to new ideas um, about how to execute our tasks, be it if it's in the engineer design stage, procurement, construction, or operations. Um, so at each of those points, we have to be ready, open and, and responsive and be willing to listen. Another attribute of um, chronic and ease is really having this, just a general propensity to worry. Um, it's, you know, we just, we don't rely in, in, you know, when we've got this propensity to worry, we don't just assume that because we've got a report that says this, that, that everything is gonna be fine. We have to be um, be able to, you know, use your 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 experience, your expertise, your skills, your training to really look at situations and um, look at out things about it that might cause you to worry or need to dig deeper into. The third one is having a healthy level of skepticism. So. Again, if, if you're getting reports and readings and dashboards that tell you one thing, 
it's okay to question that. It's okay to dig deeper into each one of those elements. And as leaders of our organizations, it's incumbent upon us to create an environment where others are invited and expected to use those healthy levels of skepticism to challenge us as leaders in on our decisions and how and um, bring new ideas. You know, perhaps we haven't considered everything. So we really need all members of the team to feel safe um, in terms of bringing uh, these attributes to the to work with them every day. You really need a, uh, to have a good imagination. Now you can look at a, a set of uh, work tasks like erecting structural steel or entering a confined space. Now, when you ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen during this event, you really have to be able to, first of all, understand the risk, but be able to imagine the absolute worst scenario and anything in between. Um, you have to be able to uh, just be keenly aware of all of the things that could happen and are the controls that we have in place, are they enough? And again, we have to uh, always work on being uh, flexible thinkers. And I know that a lot of people in the room have significant amounts of experience, but continuous learning and continuous personal development is so vital to help us keep, um, our, you know, maintain our ability to keep thinking flexibly and, and being open to new ideas and uh, new ways of executing our work. So we can just go to the next slide or just real brief chat on what the weak signals are. So really these are, these are it's your early warning system. And really those signals, it's you speaking to yourself. And you can describe them as, you know, a vague sense that something isn't as it should be. Something's not quite right. And it's really your first opportunity to start to listen, observe and reflect and, and start to explore um, other areas and you know it's 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 our opportunity to to put it at the forefront rather than pass it off and possibly deal with it later or never uh, weak signals also tell us that things are about to happen not that they've already happened so these weak signals happen very early on in a process and I, I I've been involved in a number of incidents or investigated a number of incidents where these weak signals, had they been acted on very early in the process um, and, and corrected and controlled, um, they would not have caused an incident. So it's, it's, it's a slippery slope, but if you don't um, build a habit around observing and, and acting on weak signals, you could see those weak signals ultimately turn up in an investigation and you find them as root causes. Um, I guess the most important thing is that I would ask you if you choose choose to acknowledge weak signals and what you what you're prepared to do about them. Um, I had one of the examples I had was say you're driving your car and you you hear uh, a a rattle or a noise that you didn't hear before. Are you going to stop and go and get it checked? Or are you going to ignore it and hope that it doesn't turn into anything serious? So those are, are that's an example of the choices we may make around um, acknowledging that weak signal, um, dealing with it or ignoring it. So there's some common mind traps that I also wanted to tell you about. And, you know, these are really around complacency. I, I'll talk to you really briefly about your, our own personal paradigms and, and some typical mind traps. So if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about complacency and how it happens and what we can do about it. I'll talk to you briefly about our own safety paradigms. And a number of you are very likely aware, familiar, or have talked about paradigms before, but we'll just do a quick overview in that. I also wanted to just do a check on our own risk perception and tolerance and what that means to the overall success of a project. I'll talk about risk normalization and confirmation biases, which are typically two um, mind traps that we can all get caught up in on project work. 
So if we go to the next slide, let's think about um, how we can avoid complacency. So I guess the first question is, that be this, it begs the first the question, what can drive people towards complacency? And I would take this as an opportunity to share on the message board um, just some of your ideas on what would drive people at, at various, you know, in various occupations, what would drive them to, towards complacency? And I think of things like, you know, not feeling valued, not, not being recognized for the, for the things that they bring to the, to the team. If they're not recognized, not valued, um, it's, it's gets harder and harder to keep bringing your best game every day. So, you know, my challenge to you is, you know, look at things like that. Are people demoralized? Is morale bad on the site? Um, are people in maybe not being rotated in and out of positions? Maybe the apprentices can start moving into some of the uh, tasks that typically a journeyman or a senior uh, worker would be doing. Um, things like that. This, there's some strategies that are very helpful when we can work towards um, avoiding complacency. And the biggest one is teaching to learn. And if you have ever taught a course or a class or a concept to another person, each time you do that, your own, um, your, your own understanding of the material deepens. Um, it's, it's one of the best approaches to, you know, keeping yourself sharp and, 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 you know, staving off that feeling of complacency is really get involved and teach to learn and pass on your knowledge to somebody that could absolutely use it. Um, it's also a, another good way to avoid complacency is to maximize your own learning opportunities. You remember that we're never too old to, to continue learning, to continue growing. Um, we may find other opportunities where we can teach others, but you know, it's, you, it's one of the models I've seen is where we're asked to assume that everything we know today will be um, obsolete in two years. So if we make that assumption, would it put, prompt us to go and look at additional learning activities or opportunities? And we can also look hard at our, our own behaviors that reside between identifying the risk and job completion. And we talked about that a little bit earlier with the journey management example, is that you know anytime a, a worker picks up a tool or an engineer um, picks up a set of drawings, really consider at uh, the behaviors that reside between starting the job and completing the job. And are they, are you using risk tolerance? Are you using um, chronic and ease? Are you uh, listening to weak signals? Those are all opportunities to help us stave off complacency. But I would be very interested to see what your ideas are on how we can uh, avoid complacency at all levels in the, in the organization. Next slide, please. So when I when I talk about safety paradigms, really what this means is a, your paradigm is is really the lens by which you see the world. And if you've got a clean lens or a lens that might need some polishing or maybe a new prescription, um, it, you really have to look at how you see the world because how you see the world really influences what you do. It drives all of your behaviors. It drives behaviors at home, with your re in relationships, and when you go to work. So an example is if I see if I believe, you know, my, my paradigm is that we, we can't prevent all injuries from occurring. We can't prevent all hand injuries from occurring. So if that's how I see the world, that's my paradigm, then what I do when I go to work is, is going to be influenced by that. So I would probably do things like not enforcing PPE rules. I would um, turn the other way when people are taking off their gloves to do work. Um, I wouldn't really react if I saw people... Uh, using the wrong gloves, and I wouldn't question 
um, you know, the type of, you know, hand protect, other, other types of hand protection controls that can be in place. So if I do that when I go to work every day, what do you think the results that I get are going to be? We're going to continue to have hand injuries. People are going to um, get cuts, abrasions, crush injuries. And then I'm going to say, see, I told you that would happen. I told you we couldn't reduce hand injuries. So it all depends on how you see the world. And if you're getting negative results in any area, go right back to your paradigm and, and how you're seeing safety, how you perceive safety. Because on the other side of the coin, if I see, if I see the world in a way that uh, there are so many opportunities for people in this industry, it's an exciting, vibrant um, industry that has so many opportunities for young people, uh, so, uh, new businesses, it's, it's just unbelievable. And so if I see the world that way, when I go to work, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll be promoting opportunities, training, um, uh, building resilience into our health and safety systems. I'm going to do those types of activities. And then when I get a good result, I'm going to say, see, I told you there, there was an abundance of opportunities. So again, challenge how you're, challenge your personal paradigms around, um, around safety. And I would really ask you to encourage your team members as well, just to have a, have a check. It's a very worthwhile um, strategy. So if we can just go to the next slide, please. So most of us, again, have seen mind uh, the risk perception or risk tolerance mind trap. So really just what I wanted to illustrate here was that a new worker, like, say we got a new worker on site and he, Yes, does he, I, I, do you identify the hazard? If you, do you identify a hazard? Do you see it? Is that young worker able to see the hazard? And if he can't, rec he or she can't recognize the hazard, they're, they're now in a uh, high risk position of being injured, um, significantly injured, um, harmed, because they, you know, they didn't see the didn't see the hazard and weren't able to control it because they didn't have the experience, the time on the tools, um, the training that they needed to perceive the risk and management manage it. So if we go down towards perceiving the next box to perceive the risk, so you identify a hazard, you perceive the risk. Now, do I understand it? So. If you don't understand everything that that risk or that uh, condition brings in terms of risk, then if you can't understand the hazard, you're still at risk of having an event occur. So the next decision when perceiving a risk and asking yourself, do you understand it? Um, the decision is to accept, do I accept the risk or don't I? And if the risk is accepted, as is, you go back into that risk behavior and conditions um, exist, and the workers performing the work or the project is at risk for a serious event. So when, where chronic and ease comes into this and, and generative safety and below the line thinking is when it will get you towards not accepting or not being tolerant to that risk. In that case, risk is, can be significantly assessed and mitigated, and we move towards safe execution conditions and behaviors. So key things, how, do we understand the risk? Can, how, do we perceive the risk? And if we perceive the risk, what is our tolerance for risk? Are we going to um, use chronic and ease and some of the tools to get us to a point where we can execute safely? Or are we going to continue to accept risk as it is uh, executing work the same all the ways that we did and continue to have people at risk? So I, it's again, something that I think everybody, especially new workers, um, new to the industry really need to be conscious of. But saying that it still applies to highly experienced workers 
um, that are more likely to take on um, higher risk tolerance. So I don't think anybody's immune from, from these types of risks. So we look at mine traps. Two, two that I really wanted to talk about because I think they're so relevant in, in the work that we do is the risk, norm, the risk of normalizing um, hazards. So, you know, and I, ever, I think most people have seen this, we, on a site, in a plant, we can get so used to seeing a risk that it just stops being a potential problem. We, we, start, we walk back and forth past this unguarded excavation or uh, leaking oil inside of a, a plant, things like that. So we, we get used to seeing it, so all of a sudden it, it's just part of the lands, landscape and it's no longer a problem. And, but, but as these behaviors continue to um, uh, occur, pe people in the plants, the organizations can, will continue to experience higher levels of risk by allowing um, the continuation of uh, devi deviations from normal practice. So I know that when do doing things like inspections and um, you know audits, if you see things, fix them. Um, don't let them linger and become part of the landscape because really the message to the crew is that uh, this lower standard is acceptable. And that's never the, the message that we want to send to our crews, especially if we're working towards a generative culture. So the mind trap around confirmation bias is really interesting to me. Um, it happens, it can happen when we don't seek out objective facts. Um, we may do things like interpreting information to support what we already believe to be true. Um, we may only remember remember the details that really reinforces what we believe and we we could then start ignoring information that changes beliefs so you know and i'll, I'll i just i can give give one ex an example of say we've had a a, a, cl a collapse structural steel collapse if i have um, a crane operator that then an iron worker general foreman that are assisting in that investigation i if i try if i trust them i believe them i am you know i believe they're good at their trades i consider them subject matter experts then if somebody comes along and uh, con confronts their conclusions i may be more likely to decide with them because i i know them i understand them i get what they're saying and i choose not to really hear out the person that is challenging the findings so, you know, you really, we really have to be sure that we um, see what we believe and, uh, you know, do you, do you believe what you see and uh, do, you, do you see what you believe? So, you know, another example is, you know, when there's, um, you know, in a political environment, when you have a candidate that you really, really support, you believe in the values, and then there's the, on the other side, there's, terrible things being said and, and ter you know, you don't like the other candidate. People aren't most likely to go and find out information on the candidate that, that they dislike. They're more likely to stick to the information that they like, they're used to hearing, and it really doesn't often occur to you to go and hear the other person's side. So these can all be um, examples of uh, mind, mind traps. So I wanted to get now into the chronic anise piece and how we use it in uh, project delivery. So if we can go to the next slide, Sonia. So we work collaboratively to maintain a sense of chronic anise at each step in project delivery. Our main goal is to, to move us closer to the generative safety culture. And during each, each phase, be it um, engineering, design, construction, procurement, fabrication, um, there's an opportunity to look at the look at the work, analyze how you look at our chronic anees, and develop strategy to prevent risk. So with that, I'm going to invite um, Corey Cal. First of all, Jason Westrup, who is a professional engineer, and he's a director of capital projects in Cal Calgary. 
and he's going to talk to you about sources of chronic unease in the design, engineering, and procurement phase, and some of the things that they do, some strategies they employ to reduce risk. And then Corey will follow up with the same strategies and sources of chronic unease in construction. So, Jason, it's over to you. Thank you, Vaughan. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone on the uh, on the call today, depending on where you are um, in our great country of Canada. Um, as Vaughan and Danielle have mentioned, um, I'm Jason Westrop. Uh, I'm the Projects Director um, for the Mineable Oil Sands Capital Projects Division out of Calgary. I've been with the company for around 20 years and executing major projects for that period of time also. And I'd like just to touch on, um, you know, Vaughan has talked um, very, very well on the sources of chronic, chronic unease um, and, and a lot of, lot of the aspects of that, um, mainly hinging around the construction discipline. Um, we're mindful and cognizant of the fact that, um, that these issues can present themselves at any stage of project delivery. And, and initially, I'll just touch on um, some of the main sources of chronic unease that we in within wood see within the engineering and, and design phase of a, of a project. The main ones through our experience is around change management. How we deal with change management, the processes and practices that we use to, to, to manage it. Around interdiscipline and project um, misalignment, um, miscommunication, bad interfaces within areas of the project execution team. General complacency when executing a project, um, and especially around simple repetitive tasks. We have a general problem within our industry. Um, our clients want things done, you know, faster, quicker, cheaper, um, and that normally results in us having to deal with some fairly aggressive compressed schedules. And we've we've seen significant impact on the way we execute our business um, through that. We're often asked um, to deviate from specs and standards, to do things um, for, for a better price, a better cost. And, and there's a direct impact um, of chronic unease on how we deal with those deviations. And general supervisory overload and the experience of our supervisory team and competence of our workforce in general. Some of the strategies that we use um, to, to manage those sources and de-risk them, um, Change management, you know, that the processes uh, and the application need to be relentless. Um, any risks associated with change need to be documented religiously um, and verified and closed out um, before any energization of the plant. The weak signals and the mind traps that, um, that Vaughan talked about, um, we should never assume that generic everyday tasks present a lower risk. Uh, in our experience, and I think industry is a general, um, a lot of the generic activities that we complete every day, they're normally the ones that we end up hurting someone on. Um, and that the same can be said from an engineering standpoint. Um, a lot of the mundane, repetitive tasks, um, that's when we see individuals and, and teams dropping the ball. Um, subsequently, you know, we, we remind our team never to jump to conclusions and always verify the assumptions um, that are made when appropriate data comes, becomes available. It's really important to provide um, adequate supervision and oversight um, to support the engineering function from a, from a management and supervisory perspective. Um, we, we need to educate our supervisors um, to ensure that they don't suffer in silence and take on too much work. Um, and we need to provide management support to that. Going back to the compressed schedule issue, um, you know, we need to identify the impacts when we have some of these compressed schedules to execute to. Um, we need to complete diligent risk assessments, um, establish all possible mitigations, and make sure that we follow those, uh, those mitigations through to ensure that the risks are actually mitigated through the, the project life cycle and closed out accordingly. Next slide, please. So just moving on to the next phase of a, of a project in procurement, uh, again, we, we see um, sources of chronic unease um, in, in the procurement function. 
these are normally around um, changes in scope of work upstream of, of needing to purchase equipment and materials and how those changes are filtered down and, and implemented um, in, a, in a standardized safe manner within the project. The compressed schedule um, item comes up again within procurement and the impact it can have on stress, um, manufacturing um, schedules and delivery constraints. We need to look diligently to our suppliers to make sure that we have the same level of um, health, safety and environment performance commitment from our suppliers as we expect on ourselves and from our, our clients. Managing late deliveries and the subsequent impact on the construction phase of the project um, to make sure that we get the right materials on site at the right time to, uh, to aid construction. We see sources um, of unclear communication, whether that be from uh, an engineering contractor and a vendor to a fabricator or manufacturer. And generally the status quo um, in procurement um, at being a, a repetitive kind of everyday task. Um, and the, some of the strategies that we, we use um, to deal with those sources of chronic unease is scepticism. We need to be skeptical um, uh, of our suppliers um, the conditions that our, our colleagues and, and suppliers operate under. We need to go in and validate our supplier safety performance and not just assume that everything's rosy because we don't spend, you know, every day within that shop or manufacturing facility. We should never assume that processes, systems alone mitigate, mitigate all risk um, from deliveries, changes in the work se sequence, etc. And one of the things that, that our supply chain team has, has been mindful of is to be preoccupied that a safety in incident may occur within one of our suppliers um, and to make sure that we um, do our due diligence to make sure that, um, that we do everything within our power to make sure that doesn't happen um, and we deliver our supply chain function safely um, for construction. So thank you for that. Um, I will hand over now to Corey Callahan to talk directly about construction. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. So uh, as has been mentioned, so I'm uh, I'm a 30 year plus construction guy. I thank you, Danielle, for saying I was under 30 years, but uh, no, I've, I've tipped that scale now. Um, I've been uh, just about every aspect of construction, all the way from uh, the initial phase development, uh, working with engineering, talking to uh, folks like Jason and his team about uh, the procurement risks, the the engineering risks, and then um, you know from our perspective what we get into is we get into the frontline risk. We get into the risk of where we could potentially hurt people. And that's something that uh, I, as a construction worker, and, and I'm a tradesman as well, uh, I started in the industry as a pipe fitter. Um, you know, I take safety very seriously. Um, I, was, I was raised with it. My father was a safety professional, so it's kind of ingrained into my person, uh, if you will. But um, this topic about chronic unease has really been something that I've been passionate about over the last several years because it, it really puts kind of a framework around some of the things that um, we kind of take for granted in the construction industry as, as um, you know, just things that we do. But it, it really goes to identify that we really need to trust in some things and, and, and the weak signals that, um, you know, we, we've always encountered. But um, it kind of brings them to the forefront and says, yeah, listen to them. So, you know, around the sources of chronic unease, you're going to see a lot of similarities between what Jason had discussed, um, you know, risk and managing change, um, missing the weak signals, leadership overload, uh, potential cost overrun, schedule compression. And uh, and honestly, the last one is kind of what we see if we if we choose to ignore it as a deterioration in HSSC performance. Um, you know, in construction, we have to plan our projects very succinctly right off the hop and and part of that or a huge element of that actually is um, ensuring that we've uh, you know identified all of the safety hazards and safety risks associated with the project and that we've got um, safe work practices procedures um, we've got the systems in place to manage those risks and manage that change um, you know everything from our JHA where we uh, identify the risks with our supervisors and understand them so that they are able to communicate succinctly with our crews to help us not have incidents. Um, the second point I guess is, is and I'll kind of briefly touched on it already is 
not second guessing your experience or your instinct. Um, I've seen, you know, as Vaughn had alluded to, all too many times where when we get into an incident investigation, we've had uh, individuals that we're interviewing say, well, you know, I didn't quite think that that was right, but um, I was working with a journeyman and I'm only an apprentice, so I didn't bring it up. Well, now we've got an incident. So, um, you know, it, it, it just goes to show that even if you're kind of uh, in our industry, low man on the totem pole, if you will, you've still got to bring those things up. You've got to ask the questions. You've got to have that courage, which, you know, Vaughn had mentioned is one of our core values to, to speak up and raise your hand and say, is there another way that we can do this or are we looking at this properly? So, um, so I say, you know, just don't second guess yourself. Um, and the last uh, issue is, is kind of a managerial or leadership issue that I've, I've seen play out several times now is everybody on the project needs to understand the deliverables and the uh, required outcome of the project and they need to know what the schedule looks like and what the constraints are for that. However, um, transferring that type of pressure and that type of um, stress onto the front line and onto the front line leadership daily is a detriment to the project. And what you're going to see out of that is you're going to see people shortcutting, you're going to see people taking risks, and you're going to see the risk tolerance behaviors go up. So you have to be aware of that, especially if you're in a management role, to make sure that we're keeping our craft engaged in the work and mindful on their task at hand and not worrying about the pressures that we in construction management or in project management have to worry about on a daily basis because we don't want to see that deterioration in the HSSE performance and we want to make sure that people go home safe at the end of the day. So, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Vaughn, I believe. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Jason. Really well done. So we're coming to the end. Um, just a, a couple of final things, really, when we're talking about um, the whole concept of chronic unease and, and how we work it into our businesses, our, our days, into our culture. Um, it's Chronic unease is really a below-the-line activity. And if we can focus our efforts there, I think we're going to get the highest be the highest benefit, um, but we really have to if we're if we're thinking as an industry about going in the, in this direction, or if an organization is thinking of going down the road of uh, generative safety culture, you really you have to evaluate and and deeply understand the the level of commitment um, that that's needed from highest levels of the organization and how do you get that um, into the crews and into the supervisors and middle managers, the, um, you know, the department leaders. It's got to be an all hands on deck um, approach to it. Uh, it just, it eliminates a lot of um, issues down the road in terms of folks just not being bought into it, don't agree with it. So strong alignment at the beginning is is absolutely critical but they really need to understand what what it involves um i, I think that generative safety doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't going to make mistakes so it's not a, a cure-all but uh people are going to continue to make mistakes when executing work it's just it's we're all human beings and they happen from time to time but a goal of generative safety is really to get us all to a point where you know a, an individual on a job site can make a mistake but it doesn't mean that everything's lost our, our role is to build enough resiliency into the system that one mistake is not going to derail the whole process and um, and it also helps eliminate loss of, potential loss events so I said it earlier, don't let weak signals become root causes. Um, watch for those mind traps. Get your teams involved. Um, let them know that a questioning attitude is absolutely okay. And talk to them about chronic unease and what lies below the line. And I really appreciate your time. Um, it's an important topic. I'm sure, and I know it's an important topic for all of you. And I'm going to just turn this over now to Scott. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments or wants to share 
additional information, we'd be happy to have you. Thank you very much, Vaughn. Uh, terrific overview presentation and, and the examples provided by Jason and Corey as well. I mean, we really are you know, at the top of the hour here, which means we're at the end of our time. So if anybody had a, a question that we could answer quickly, we'd love to do it now. But otherwise, if, if you'd prefer to get in touch with one of us offline, uh, you know, we, we certainly can do it that way as well. Uh, hopefully that was thought pr provoking uh, and uh, generated some, you know, kind of counter and interesting points of view. We did get a couple of great uh, comments in the chat as the presentation was going on. I don't see anything coming up. So I, I think with that, maybe I'll pass it back to you, Danielle. If you've got any closing comments. Uh... Yep, I was just going to say we are rounding out the hour, so I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you once again to our moderator, Scott, and all of our panelists, and to all of you for joining us. Um, as Scott mentioned, if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to, or if you think of some later, um, just send them to me or any of the panelists, and um, I, I can either answer them or forward them to the correct contact. Um, and also stay tuned for more information on the next webinar in this series, which will follow in the coming weeks. Thank you and stay safe.